Yemunla, you're listening to Kao Karamo EV, Kao Karamo, the English version. Kao Karamo is a podcast about the representation of the Caribbean in cinema and television. I'm your host, Maila, and I'm from Guadeloupe. Welcome to season three. Welcome to a new episode of Kao Karamo EV, Kao Karamo, the English version. The podcast is still on a break because I'm working on the French version. <laughs> Meanwhile, I wanted to present you a new discussion. Caro Caramon is about curating films defining our Caribbean identity and honoring our Caribbean history. So I'm always looking for narratives all across the region. Today, I'm glad to present you this discussion with Walter Alomar, the founder of the Ocho organization. His film, Colonization is Extinction, is to shine light on the current state of Puerto Rico, its governmental state, as well as key people involved in the struggle to improve Puerto Rico for its people. I hope you will enjoy this discussion. Okay, my name is Walter Walteri Valamont. I'm the president of the Organization for Culture of Hispanic Origins. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that provides cultural, educational, and mental health services to the community. And I also directed a film about Puerto Rico and the economic crisis, and it's called Colonization is Extinction. Thank you so much for being with us today. So since Caru Caramon is really about showing different perspectives of what being Caribbean is, uh, mm -hmm. it's really important to me to show also the perspective from Spanish-speaking countries. And you will be the second yeah. interview I have with someone from a Spanish-speaking country from the Caribbean. So can yeah. you tell us why did you decide to make this film? Well, one of the reasons I decided to make this film is that um, early on, a couple of years ago, I decided to get into uh, politics uh, here in the U.S. and I, it started to pique my interest. And um, before I, I started to do that, I said, you know, let me, uh, let me look into what's happening in my own island. I did a little bit of homework and I started to dig into the history of Puerto Rico and the United States. And one of the first things that I found out is that uh, over 35% of the women in Puerto Rico in the 1950s were sterilized by the U.S. government. And that kind of blew my mind. And my, my parents, uh, you know, from Puerto Rico, they were in Puerto Rico uh, during that time and had never spoken about this. And when I found out about this, I was just kind of blown away. And I was like, wow, how could this be? I thought we were a commonwealth and I thought we were part of the U.S. And all these, uh, you know, these falsehoods that's uh, perpetuated by the United States. And then I started to dig deeper, you know, and I found out that it was illegal to fly the Puerto Rican flag in Puerto Rico, that it was banned to speak Spanish in school. And if, if teachers were teaching uh, Spanish to the students in school instead of English, uh, they would be they would lose their jobs. Uh, the, the massacres and the uprisings that occurred uh, during the revolutions because people were fighting for, for freedom and they wanted the U.S. out of Puerto, they, Puerto, out of Puerto Rico. So this kind of all this kind of came. Uh, I had this rush of knowledge and information. And then I started to ask around. I started to ask my own community, you know, so, hey, did you guys know about this or, you know, did you guys know about that? And then and, and I asked old and young and island born and, and U.S. born. And most of us had no idea about what was happening in our own homeland and what kind of relationship the United States has with Puerto Rico. So I was like, wow, this is uh, this is mind blowing. You know, this is this is outrageous. And I said, well, this is, you know, uh, this is something that it can't stay like this. This is, this, you know, this must change. So I decided that. So that's when I decided to say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to create something myself. I'm going to put you know, some information together. I'm going to create a documentary and I'm going to push it out there in, into the world so that, you know, people can have access to this, to this information and actually find out what the true history between Puerto Rico and the United States, what it really is and what's been happening over the last 124 years. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you said that you asked your parents about what was going on when they were living on the island. So my question would be, did people know back then what was happening? Yes. Uh, I mean, if you were on the island, I mean, there was no, uh, you know, back in like in the 1940s, and, and there was no radio coming this way. But if you were on the island, you were subject to that. Uh, my parents were subjects to that. Okay. But they never, never sat down and, and explained that uh, to me. So, um, you know, if you weren't, from the island or if you didn't just you know leave the island and come to the u.s 
uh, most people had had no idea about what was going on, you know, since in, in, right after World War II, and this is this is one of the issues that are still affecting the island today. They use the island of Vieques as bombing as a bombing range, and there's thousands of people that live on that island. And for over 60 years, until about 2003, I believe, the the U.S. Navy and the Marines finally left the island of, of Vieques, and that island has the highest contamination. Uh, for cancer rates in all of Puerto Rico, the people, you know, and uh, because for there's millions of pounds of unexploded ordinances that are laying in the ocean, that are laying on the sand, and that have yet to be cleaned up. Now, all these chemicals are leaking into the land and leaking into the ocean and the people, we farm the land, we eat the animals that, uh, you know, that, that are from the land and we eat the fish from the sea. And, and there's all these contaminants and, and that has the highest uh, levels of like uh, aluminum, antimony in the people. There was a study by the University of Puerto Rico that came out uh, back in the early 2000s, and it was, uh, and it shows that the island, that island in particular, has the highest uh, uh, contamination and, and cancer in all of Puerto Rico. And there's no main hospital on that island. So if you if you need cancer treatment, you have to go from the uh, from the island of Vieques, you have to take a ferry to the mainland and then go to the main hospital, and it's all it's a whole long arduous process, especially for somebody who has to uh, who's susceptible to to chemo treatment. So, um, and this is they're still currently cleaning up the island, and they're still having problems with the cleanup. They, their idea of cleaning up is open detonation. So basically, they're just exploding the ordinances. They're bringing them up to the surface, and once they get into the surface, they're just exploding them. But these chemicals are still spreading out throughout the rest of the island, and they're still getting on the crops, and still contaminating the people. You know, this is this is something that's really mind blowing, and it's incredible that this knowledge is, is just this information is just kept so quiet. You know, but you know, again, it's at the hands of the U.S. So you know, no one wants to air the dirty laundry. Exactly. I realized that in Guadeloupe, we went through. I mean, we are going through a lot of stuff that Puerto Rico went through or is going through. And that made me realize that really colonization just works the same way, regardless of where it is. When you were doing your research, was it easy to have access to the information? It was relatively simple. Uh, I had different people, let's say, uh, who were experts in this in a particular field who were able to relate the information to me. So I have... Uh, Ana Lopez, she's a professor at the University of, of Hostos in New York, and she gave me the historical context. You know, she started, in, you, as you saw in the film, you know, she started with the brief history about Columbus and the and, the, and his invasion and, and what took place. And, and she brought in basically that early timeline, you know, as far as what took place right up, you know, 1898, when the, then the U.S. invaded right after the Spanish-American War and they sold Puerto Rico you know, uh, to the United States. And then I had um, I had Nelson Dennis, of course, you know, he's the author of the book War Against All Puerto Ricans. He was a former state assemblyman. So he gave me the economic and the political side of what was taking place during the island. And then I had political activists who were currently, you know, who were had been arrested and were in Vieques and, and were, you know, were running around uh, basically, you know, protesting and marching and, and uh, trying to raise awareness about what was happening. The hardest part was... I had six hours of footage. That's that was the most difficult part. Was I had all this information, and I had to consolidate it and make it so that it's viewable. You know, I, like I I could have done a series, and people some people have said that you know well maybe you could have done you know like a five or six part series. You know, which now in retrospect I guess I could have, but at the time, um, I felt that this information was key, and I I wanted to get it out there, and I, I had no I, I didn't even think about the the series. There was a lot of things that were going on. You know. Uh, Puerto Rico was in the news uh, a lot because of the debt. So I was thinking, okay, now was the time to, you know, to, to get this message out because it's, you know, for the first time you actually saw you turn on the mainstream media, you know, and, and you actually heard conversations about the debt crisis in Puerto Rico, which is never, you know, you don't hear anything about whatever's going on in Puerto Rico. So the, the information was relatively easy to come by. The information is out there. I have spoke to people from the university called Boricua College. I, I spoke to to several people. So the information is out there. It's, it's very simple to access. It's just a matter of trying to put it all together, create that proper timeline, and then make it so that it's easy to ingest, you know, without pointing, you know, giving you a lesson, you know what I mean? Trying to keep the people's interest without it sounding like a sermon or, or things like that. So that was kind of like the most difficult part. I mean, I, I want your perspective as a filmmaker. 
since you were working on real life issues and it was about your history how did you feel was there a moment when it was too much yes yes um th there was a moment um there's a there's a part that i do in the film it's a series of on the street questions so um i i you know i get all this information the political the historical information and then i say okay well let's let's see how much the public the general Boricua or slash Puerto Ricans. Let's see how much they know on the street, and let's get this information out there. Let's see the let's see the knowledge or the lack of knowledge. So I spent we we spent a whole day you know uh, shooting in Spanish Harlem in the Bajio, which is like the the heart uh, uh, of uh, of Spanish Harlem. They, you know it's, that's what they call it. It's called Spanish Harlem. It's on 106th Street, there's a mural of Don Pedro Alviso Campos and Che Guevara. And, and you know, it talks about like, you know, we're, we're birds of a feather. So we, we, we put ourselves out there and we were out there all day and we were just randomly stopping people, asking people if they were interested in, in participating in a film and, and would they be, you know, willing, it's just a matter of answering some questions. And when we asked people questions, uh, the answers that we got uh, were mind blowing, um, you know, We, we ask and we asked a couple of hard questions, you know, like some of the questions that we asked, we were like, well, you know, where are you from? Are you, you know, and they're like, okay, you know, I'm Puerto Rican. And I'm like, okay, great. And I said, well, so, you know, did you know about the sterilization back in the 1940s and 30s and things like that? And they were like, no, they had no idea. And then, when, you know, we there was this one guy in particular, he was a Marine and he was like 12 years of his life in the Marine. And I said, well, okay, well, if the United States went to war with Puerto Rico, what side would you fight? He refused to answer the question. You know, uh, uh, what are the colors of the Puerto Rican flag mean? No one had any idea. You know, give me the name of a Puerto Rican national hero who is not an athlete or an entertainer. You know, like a Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, you know, uh, Sojourner Truth. No one had any idea of what I was talking about. And that was kind of the most uh, heart wrenching because I asked people who were born on the island. I asked people who were in their 60s. And then I asked the young kids, you know, which is understandable, you know, if you're 15, and not 15, but if you're, you know, 18, 20, 25 years old and you're growing up in the US, you know, at that time, you know, you're not thinking about, you know, historic Puerto Rico, you're thinking about school or, you know, trying to get a job, going into college or whatever the case may be. But we were out there, like I said, all day and we had hours uh, of, of Q and A with the people. And nine out of 10 could not answer any of the questions that were put to them. Even a, a simple question like what the colors of the flag mean, because, you know, that's one of the, you know, here in the U.S. And that, that's one of the things that you see that's very popular. If you, you know, you see Puerto Rican flags just about everywhere you go. Nine out of 10 of them can't tell you what the colors mean. They can't tell you, you know, who created the flag or when was the flag created or what the symbolism behind the flag. And that shows that the lack of knowledge Uh, in our community is destructive. And the less we know, um, the more we lose, you know? So that was kind of like one of the, the, the most difficult part of, of actually making the film was, you know, of course, finding out the stories about, you know, some of the things that took place in Puerto Rico, but then this was kind of like a live thing where we're asking, you know, people right on the spot, what they feel, what they think, what they know. And, and, and it was, you know, it, it was very disappointing and, uh, and very, very moving uh, how little people know about their own culture. Did you give them the answers to the question? Yes, yes. I mean, what, uh, initially, right after, once we, for the most part, pretty much once, once we, sh we finished the shoot, um, then we would inform people, that, hey, you know, this is, you know, this took place, that took place, this is the colors of the flag. And then we gave them our contact information. So if they wanted to follow up with us or whatever the case may be, but, um, you know, so we, you know, we kept them in the loop. We, we tried to educate them uh, on the mo in the moment, but, uh, um, You know, it's it's incredible how much our own people uh, don't know about our, our community, our, 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 our politics, our heroes. You know, we, we, we call heroes like football players or basketball players, or ridiculousness like that. People who throw, you know, who play games. You know, we have meanwhile, we have people who, you know, uh, fought for independence or they fought for the rights of the people. You know, real heroes, people who gave their lives, you know, for their for their homeland. And, and instead, we rather, you know, uh, uh, call a guy a hero who, who catches a ball or, or who can run a pass. You know, it's very eye-opening what we came across while making the film. You, you used the example of the flag. And 
that's the example I often use to explain how it is complex for us to define our identity. Are we French or are we Guadeloupean? Because we don't have a flag. Our flag is the French flag. Right. But between the, the late 19th century and the early 20th century, then you have the Negritude movement and all that. So there's this consciousness, this awareness about our blackness, about our black identity and the fact that we are not just, we cannot just be French. Right. So we have an unofficial flag that came mm. from the, oh, what the word? Oh. The union? Like, union, union, that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's not the kind of word I use usually in English. So it's it, okay. So right. let's. So <laughs> we have an unofficial flag coming from this Union fights mm -hmm. during the 20th century. And I'm so happy that some of our artists took this flag and really promoted it to the younger generations. And when we go to Caribbean events, you will see mm -hmm. this flag now. You won't see Very the French good. flag. So, so it's it's starting to change, but it's taking mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And when you say the access to the info is easy, mm -hmm. but it's like people, since they don't actually know it's there, so they cannot go and look for it. And yeah. for us, it's kind of the opposite mm -hmm. because we do have historians that worked really hard who really studied these different aspects of our history mm -hmm. but people refuse to go and look for the info yeah that happens that that happens a lot because it's especially on on in this side of the diaspora uh because you know, well it's two things you know uh well number one we've become comfortable in our oppression we become very comfortable in our oppression. We become very comfortable with the fact that whatever's taking place in Puerto Rico, we as the diaspora, we kind of see it like we divide ourselves. We say, well, that's happening over there. I live here. I work here. My family's here. And we're all doing okay. So as far as I'm concerned, what's happening over there is over there, you know. And then, they, of course, you know, when you, when you, uh, when you watch the media, you know, they, they pump the the uh, the ideology that uh well puerto rico was so corrupt and the corruption and and corruption 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 you know meanwhile the united states is the most corrupt country you know in the in the last 500 years this land got rich off the backs of slaves okay and it stole the land uh from the indigenous people of this of this country you know and it's, it's estimated somewhere around 100 million uh between the slave trade and the indigenous people were massacred or were lost uh, during the birth of this country, you know, and people are still fighting for reparations, you know, for 400 years, you know, and, and nobody's getting anything, you know, I mean, you, it's a struggle, you know, because if they, if they, if they had, if they give a rep, if they give reparations in the United States, they'd have to give reparations. They'd have to get it from Italy, from France, from Germany, from all, all over the country, from all over the world. You know, so that's something that, that everybody is, is of course, or the governments are, are fighting against, you know, so this country is in no position to, to point a finger at anybody else and talk about corruption, you know, but we've become comfortable in that. You know, we, we, we feed, we, we eat what they feed us. You know, they feed us the constant lies and the, the rumors and, and these allegations, you know, and, and we've become comfortable with that. And, and we, we're kind of like, as long as we're doing okay, we're, we're really not interested in, in, in making mess and making, in, in creating issues, you know, and, and raising awareness or things like that, because, you know, we're, me and mine are doing fine. You know, my family's doing well. Every, you know, everybody in my household is doing well. You know, and that's the problem is that we kind of create a little a border between us and, and them. And sometimes, and they do the same thing with us. Mm -hmm. They look at us and they say, well, you're not really, you know, Puerto Rican because you, you weren't born here or you didn't grow up here or you don't speak Spanish well. Meanwhile, Spanish is a colonial language. You know, so you're proud of the fact that you speak a colonial language, that you lost your original language and you want to make fun of others, you know, because they don't speak it as well. You know, it's a colonial language. English is a colonial language. 
but this is the mindset of the people. You know, they're, they're, they'd rather go toe to toe with me and argue with me when I talk about independence or when I talk about change. They'd rather fight against me as opposed to the real oppressor and the people that's really you know, affecting the island of, of, of Puerto Rico. So as long as we're busy fighting against each other, we're not fighting against the real enemy. And that's and that's kind of like the way it is. It seems to be, you know, all, all, all over. You know, uh, in, in particular, where where you know a, a lot in the Caribbean, in the Caribbean, uh, that it, we kind of have that same notion. You know, like we're, we're fighting against each other, and you know, we want different things. And and meanwhile, the powers that be, you know, they're the ones who are in control of everything, and and we don't really realize that. You know, so we we get lost in the in, in this mix. So since you're talking about it, would you be interested in making a film about uh, independence fighters, for instance, or the resistance? I would. I would. Uh, unfortunately, um, like right now, uh, <laughs> time and money is, uh, you know, is is, uh, is a bit tied up. Um, but I am. I have been working with other people who um, with another gentleman. Uh, He's in the process. He's interested in creating a, a series that that may possibly be on uh, on Netflix, and it talks about the life of Don Pedro Albizu Campos, who was the head of the Puerto Rican Nationalist Party, and he was he led the independence movement back in the 1930s. Uh, and you know, he's interested in doing a series about his life, and and we we talked about working together, uh, you know, as a, as a as a consultant on the films or on the on the series, so that you know, uh, again. You know, a lot of us don't know who Don Pedro Albizu Campos is, whether you're, you know, born here or there, and and you know, we we need heroes that, uh, uh, you know, that look like us. He was an Afro Puerto Rican, and and we need that, you know. And so he's interested in doing something like that. There's a play also as well that that's kind of in the works as far as you know some of the trials that took place regarding uh, uh, Don Pedro. So uh, there, there are a couple of things in the works. I myself right now, I'm not in a position to actually do anything myself. I mean, the, the project, my own project took me about four years total of gathering information, shooting, editing, sound. And I didn't go to film school. Mm-hmm. You know, I had to, I just figured this out as I went along. You know, I, I, I had a, uh, you know, buddy of mine who was a cameraman, you know, with this big company at the time. And, and you know, he came along for the ride and it was all basically uh, everybody volunteered their time, you know, to to do the interviews. And, and it was all, you know, everybody, it was all just volunteer. But then, you know, the the behind the scenes stuff, you know. So um, I, I I definitely would do something given the, 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 the correct circumstances about, you know, independence fighters, let's say, throughout the Caribbean, uh, because there was something that was called uh, the Antillian Confederation many years ago, where um, the leaders of uh, the Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico, and Cuba were in, were interested in creating the, the Antillean Confederation, where we would unify a- along with, with Haiti and basically create our own form of government within the Caribbean, you know. But, you know, unfortunately, um, it didn't pan out the way planned at the time, but it was called the Antillean uh, Confederation. And that's kind of like what we need, you know, we, you know, we, we, we're all from the same area, you know, whether Puerto Rican, Cuban, Dominican, and so on, Jamaica, you know, we're all in, we're all in that same boat. We're all from that same area and we're all pretty much suffering, whether it's under the British, you know, whether it's under the French or whether it's under the U S you know, we're all still colonial countries, you know, and they're still ruling over us and they're still dictating policy over us. And that shouldn't be. You know, that should, that, should, that, that should not be, you know, we should, we should be, in, you know, the, the, the United States and these other countries, they, they promote so-called freedom and democracy, but yet they have colonies in the Caribbean, you know, and in Africa, you know, where, where the, you know, you, where this is still going on, you know, they're still ruling the land, they're taking the resources, you know, which is always the, the, the main reason that the U.S. does anything. If they do anything, they do it all for money. That's how all the European countries are. So they come in and they just they want our resources. You know, our countries are poor because they take they take the riches of our countries. You know, that's that was that was the name of, of the island, Puerto Rico, rich port, port of riches. You know, that, that was why they called it that, because of our resources, you know, and they came in and they just, you know, swooped everything. They, they take everything and then they make themselves rich. And and then where's left struggling? And then they say, well, you can't you can't manage without us. We give in to that slave mind, and even though the chains have have come off our necks and our, and our you know the shackles have come off, they still have us up here. You know we're we're still you know we're still slaves of the mind. As long as they have us slaves of the mind, they're going to always rule over us. Yeah, 
can you tell us about what you do now with Ocho and what okay. you did um, on June the 20th of 2022? The United Nations. Yes. Well, what uh, I, I have a couple of products that are um, that I've done with my with my nonprofit. Uh, one of the things that I did, I was um, I created a monument because right after Hurricane Maria, over 4,645 Puerto Ricans perished. They lost their lives because of the hurricane that took place, and it took nearly a year to restore the power in Puerto Rico. And it was, you know, that that you know, it was it, it's unheard of how long it took to restore the power. And I was there. I was actually part of the um, the restoration because I was a lineman at the time. I was working on the power lines. So uh, I got to see firsthand dealing with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers, how much more problems they caused as opposed to what they solved. But um, what I did was I erected a monument here in New York City uh, to honor those victims. You know, and what I want, what I plan on doing, and I did this last year, was I have an event every year at this place, it's called Taino Towers in, in, uh, in New York City, in Spanish Harlem, where we can get together, light a candle, say a few words, and talk about how we felt when, when we lost all those people. Uh, another one of my current projects right now um, that I'm involved in is because of the uh, fiscal crisis in Puerto Rico, over 600 schools have closed in the last 10 years, leaving some, somewhere around 300,000 students without any place to go as far as education. So those schools have become available to the general public. I put in an, an application to reopen one of the schools and turn it into a community center where we're going to offer mental health treatment, job training, uh, and education as well to the community. You know, and we plan on, and, and I just got approved. That, that's also, that also took me several years to, uh, to, uh, to, to undertake. And uh, I just got approved uh, for the school in Juana Diaz, Puerto Rico, uh, that will be mine shortly, and and you know I can I can create um, the project. You know I can I can go forward and, and provide these uh, services to the community that's sorely really needed. And then of course um, the United Nations, my, my my nonprofit organization is an NGO. We're a non-governmental organization uh, with the United Nations, and we get to attend sessions at the UN regarding any socioeconomic issues, whether it's you know DR, Puerto Rico, Cuba, uh, West Africa, and so on. And I've been going there for uh, the last couple of years, and I've been speaking on, the, on behalf of, of the, there's approximately, I believe, uh, uh, somewhere around 17 or 18 colonies, uh, you know, uh, with it, that belong, you know, between the US and, and, and British to decolonize these lands. You know, to to give the to give the land back to the people to to restore. And uh, you know, unfortunately, um, it's it's the it's the General Assembly where these issues have to be brought up. These are special sessions. These are you know they call them C24s. You know, special uh, sessions to decolonize. You know, you know several countries around the world, Puerto Rico's included. So we get to speak and we get to say our piece. We get you know uh, five minutes to 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 discuss why we believe decolonization or independence. Or you can, if you believe in statehood, you can you can speak about why you believe that that would be the best option in order to, in the case of Puerto Rico, for Puerto Rico either to become a state or to or become an independent nation. I believe in independence. So I believe that we should be free. So that's something that I've been doing for the last several years. You know, it's another way, it's another form of expression. We've never hit the General Assembly yet. You know, our issues have to be brought forth to the General Assembly, has to be addressed. It's just that, unfortunately, um, because we are a colony of the United States, we can't get in on that. Another co a neighboring country, let's say like Cuba or the Dominican Republic, would basically have to surrender their time at the General Assembly and allow us to air our grievance at the General Assembly. But unfortunately, of course, all these other countries, they have their own issues. You know, Cuba wants to, to lift the blockade and so on so you know it's you, you can't it's very difficult to expect another country to give up their time so that we can present our time so it's very it's understandable but it's it's a process that uh, that is is permitted uh for us and as long as we continue with the process then there's still awareness that we still want independence that there are people out there who believe in independence for puerto rico who want independence for puerto rico and will take the necessary steps to try to make that happen so how can people help you? Well, if anybody wants to support me, uh, they can just reach out to me. I have a website. I have my email. It's 
theocho.net. That's T-H-E-O-C-H-O.net. Yeah, I have a website there. I have a, a subscription uh, sign up where people can put in their information and and discuss, you know, if they're interested in, in taking place or in taking part of any of the of the events that we uh, are part of. Also, my email, T-H-E-O-C-H-O dot net at gmail.com. If you're interested in, in, again, partaking, you can reach out to me directly uh, by email and you can let us know, you know, what it, how much you know, you're willing uh, to contribute to make these uh, to make these things possible, because, you know, quite honestly, the revolution costs money. Everything costs money. You know, to rebuild a school is going to cost money. When we did the monument, it, it was, you know, it costs money. And in order to to uh, continue with the struggle for independence, we we have to continue to promote and to push and to educate. You know, like I've, I've uh, you know, I've been fortunate enough. I've I've uh, I've gone to several institutions. You know, Columbia University, Boston, and I talk about, um, you know, what's what's uh, currently happening in, in in Puerto Rico. But we we definitely need uh, the people's so help. People have to step forward you know uh it, it, no more armchair revolutionaries you know too many people they want to sit back and they want to talk about change or what they think or what they think but they have you have to get in the game you have to have some skin in the game you know if you are a proud boricua slash puerto rican and you really believe in 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 you know in in the betterment of your country and your people you have to take action we can't rise above our people uh, even though i may if i'm a success and you know you have jennifer lopez or you have all these other people you know but our country is still struggling as a whole, you know, and, and if one of us are in the bottom, then we're all in the bottom, you know, and we need the support of the, the community. They have to get involved um, to, you know, to raise awareness about these issues, because these, these are issues that are affecting generations. And we're growing up with the same kind of mindset. And it's very destructive. It, you know, it's, it's going to be a dark future for the people of Puerto Rico if things don't change. Can you just expand a little bit on dark future what do you mean by dark future for puerto rico well okay so back in the in the in the 1950s um there used to be there was commercials that were promoted on television in puerto rico and it was uh come to the u.s you know there's there's many jobs here this you know there's a lot of opportunities economically and and so on and come to the u.s and you know and they and they actually had planes and they chartered planes and, and they they brought people to the united states basically Uh, nearly free of charge, you know, and these people, when they came here, uh, they were put in the slums, you know, in the Bronx, in Brooklyn, in rat infested and in roach infested areas, you know, and, and they worked in the garment district and they worked for pennies on the dollar, you know, and, and this so-called bright future that was promised, to, to, you know, to the people of Puerto Rico, the whole, you know, because of these commercials wasn't there, you know, and my parents were, they were, they were part of that when, when they came here. Now, in Puerto Rico right now, Puerto Rico is being gentrified right now. It's turning into something else. It's turning into something else that we've never seen before. You know, the the city, the, the town of Condado in particular in Puerto Rico uh, looks like lower Manhattan. Looks like lower Manhattan. Um, you know, there's uh, people are coming in and the the after the hurricane and there's been over there's been over uh, 200 earthquakes, by the way, uh, since the since the hurricane, uh, people were in positions where they had to abandon their homes uh, because the way things work in Puerto Rico, you know, if your grandfather had a house, then your father got the house and then you got the house. But it was originally in your grandfather's name. So now you just live there. So now when we had the hurricane and you went to FEMA and you said, hey, I need some money for the house. They were like, well, this where's the paperwork? And well, the paperwork's in my grandfather's name. Well, he's been dead 50 years, so we can't help you. But here's two thousand dollars. We'll send you to Florida. You know, so we won't help you rebuild your home, but we'll help you relocate. And that was like a thing that was going on and on and on and on the island. So people were fleeing the island, you know, like the population has, has dropped over over like a million Uh, people have, have fled the island uh, since Hurricane Maria in 2017, 2018. And, uh, um, you know, so now you have all these abandoned buildings and these ab abandoned homes. So now what's coming in is the, the dominant culture. They're all coming in now and they're buying up lots, lots and lots of properties. And now all they want to do is rebuild. They want to rebuild, they want to make hotels or they want to make Airbnbs. And of course, you know, $5,000 a week or whatever. And, and 
right off the beach. And, and they're actually trying to also privatize the beaches. You know, the, 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 you know, the Americans are coming in and they want to privatize the beach. They want to say that this portion of the beach, you know, belongs to the hotel and so on. And it doesn't work that way in Puerto Rico. All the beaches are all public. They, they belong to the, the people. But they're actually trying to introduce that as well. So they're coming in and they're just buying everything out and they're pushing us out of our own land. And uh, it's happening all over the island. You know, but, but Condado is like a very big hot spot. You know, all the tourists go there. You see everybody there. When you go there, it's, you might as well stay in New York City, you know, as, as opposed to, you know, going uh, to visiting Puerto Rico. And I believe that uh, the way things are going at this rate, once the island has been bought up, once, once they've had their fill of, of what they want to do, then they're going to say, they're going to they're going to start pushing commercial gets again like I did back in the 1950s saying come back home come back to Puerto Rico come back home you know come visit your homeland and then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be the serving class once again would you like a fresh towel would you like another drink you know would you like some fresh sheets once again we're going to you know we're we're going to be the serving class in our own country to these outsiders you know who are just coming in and just basically taking over and because they got money Everything, any, anything and everything is for sale. So, you know, that's that's part of what I believe uh, will be very destructive. Puerto Rico is not going to be uh, what it was. You know, like, I, I, you know, my family's from the mountains, you know, and that, that's the only place. Those are the only places that they're staying away from. You know, nobody wants to go in the mountains. Nobody wants to go, you know, near the camps. Everybody just wants to wants the coastline, you know, so that they can go surfing and like Rincon and other places, you know, you they, they, they want those areas, you know, they can sit and have their uh, white wine spritzer or their rosé, you know, as they're watching the sun, uh, you know, go down. And, uh, and, and, you know, once again, like I said, uh, um, it, it's being taken away from us. We're losing our island, you know, and we're losing the things that, that make us us, you know, and the, we're, our culture is going to, uh, you know, eventually start to dissipate as well. You know, I mean, because like Christmas is, you know, that's a big thing on the island. That was never a thing on the island. You know, there's many holidays that are being celebrated on the island that, you know, that have nothing to do with us. You know, Fourth of July and Halloween, you know, that, that's not a Puerto Rican thing, you know, but these these things are being introduced, you know, slowly but surely. And, and, and you know, they're starting to take over and that's going to gonna, that's gonna become part of the culture as well. And, you know, Puerto Rico is not going to be uh, what it was. It's going to be something else. We're going through the same thing. <laughs> Like when you say they um, they gave people plane tickets to come to the U.S. and all that, they did mm -hmm. the same thing with Guadeloupe and Martinique. And I mean, the youth left the islands in the mm -hmm. six in the sixties, sixties, seventies, and then they never went back. They never mm -hmm. went back. And right now we do have this problem. I mean, my generation, I feel like there are a lot who really want to go back, who's trying mm -hmm. to go back, but we don't have the job. I mean, we got degrees and all that, but when we go over there, they don't want to hire us. They just want right. to hire white people, French white people. Right. So those who really, really try, they usually have to create their own, their own job because they just don't mm -hmm. find anything. So... I mean, we're, we're fighting the same fight. And it's, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one of the things, too, that I, I think that we have to understand is, as Puerto Ricans, we're the same people. We are the same people. Like, for example, uh, my oldest sister is darker than you. Okay. My mother is darker than you. You know, my father is more indigenous. You know, he, he looks more like a Taino Indian. That's why I look the way I do. But... We are the same. We're black. If you're Puerto Rican, if you're Cuban, if you're, if you're from the Dominican Republic, you have black blood in you. Okay. So that's what we, we need to abandon that because too many times the colorism thing, even on, even on the island, you know, we have this division, you know, well, I'm light skin, you're dark skin, you know, I, they think I'm, I'm better or they think you're worse. And we have to get rid of that foolishness. Okay. Because the white man don't see us as any different. Exactly. You know, he doesn't he, he doesn't let me go. He pulls me over, you know, just as much as he pulls over anybody else, because when he sees me, he gets nervous, mm -hmm. you know, and he doesn't it doesn't just because I'm a little bit lighter. 
doesn't mean that you know I get a, I get a pass. You know, now you know there, there have been certain situations where you know people are treated you know they're they're preferred, so to speak. But that is to create division between us. That's why it's it's not because you know uh, you know it's it's better to be lighter. It's, it's worse to be absolutely not. We're all the same people. You know, we're from the Caribbean. We got black blood in us. We all got we're all Africans. You know, so just some lighter than others. But we're all the same people. That's why we're all suffering the same struggle because we're the same people, okay? And, and and even us, like I said, us as Puerto Ricans or, you know, Boricuas is really the term I like to use. Um, we have to face that because we've been taught by our slave masters that, no, you're different or you're from Spain. No, 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 no. We're not from Spain, okay? Spaniards are European. You know, if, you put, if you're Puerto Rican, go to Spain and see how they treat you. If you think you're one of them you see, and, and see how they treat you. You know, they will look at you with disgust and they will make fun of how you look. They will make fun of everything. They have no shame in their game. And they're the ones who conquered us. You know, they're the ones who invaded the island. So don't try to include yourself in that. You know, embrace who you are, embrace your hair, embrace your skin, you know, and, and love those around you who look like you because we are the same people. You know, and as long and if we can clear that hurdle. And we can come together. There's there's strength in that. But as long as we, you know, as, as long as we want to partake with this colorism and this foolishness, uh, you know, we'll we'll continue to be at the bottom. Thank you for listening. Make sure to subscribe to my newsletter. The Kaukamo Universe is also a Caribbean literature podcast. Tim Tim Wafik, a Caribbean music podcast. Hashtag Stream Caribbean. If you want to listen to the episodes and read my other reviews, go to caricaramon.com. If you want to contact me, you can email me at caricaramon at gmail.com and follow me on social media at caricaramon on Twitter and Instagram. All links are in the description box. Don't forget to like and share the episode to give the podcast more visibility. See you à dans d'autres soleils. Ciao,